London and the library of my club towards the end of an afternoon in late November. The lamps were lit and a good fire crackled in the great stone fireplace. I had a mind to drink a quiet pot of tea and glance at the early edition of the evening paper content in my own company. Nevertheless, I responded readily enough to the nod of the man seated a little apart in one of the deep recesses between reading desks, for he always cut a melancholy figure, and my conscience was pricked by seeing him alone. Sir James Monmouth was a reserved, still handsome man, and what I knew of him I liked. I said cheerfully as the tea arrived, I had an excellent walk. I confess to loving the streets of London, no matter the weather. Ah, Sir James said, the London streets. Yes, a man may walk for many an hour through them. You are generally here, Sir James? Yes, yes, generally here. I pray I may always be so, for this place is home to me now, and friends and family too. Something in his tone affected me, so that I felt a sudden unease. But a couple of my friends came across to join us, and the mood was lifted. The subject of ghosts was raised as we sat in the smoking room after dinner, and over glasses and pipes the story of the club ghost was told, and reckoned to be a feeble and unremarkable one. And so the subject was dropped, and we went on to talk of quite other matters. The party broke up just before midnight, and Sir James and I left together. I was sure he had not come out with me simply in order to stretch his legs after an evening seated indoors. His beak-nosed face was gaunt and skull-like beneath the thin hair. I realized that he was much older than I had supposed. I could not help but overhear your conversation in the smoking room. Oh, that was idle enough talk, but you appeared more serious. I have a story which perhaps you might care to read. A true story or a fiction? You are an author, Sir James? No, no, no. It is merely an account of certain events. Just then footsteps began to be heard at the far end of the street. Sir James turned his head quickly and peered through the murk. Then, abruptly, his hand shot out and he clutched my arm. I beg you, he said, read it. It was several days before I was at the club again. I came in through the swing doors to be greeted by Sidem, the porter. Oh, one moment, if you please, sir. I have a package for you entrusted to my keeping given to me by Sir James Monmouth. I put the package with my coat and went in to enjoy a whisky and soda. I spoke to no one, and after a browse through a pile of sporting periodicals, my eyes felt heavy enough to prompt me to think of making for home. The walk through a very cold night stirred me fully awake again, and not wanting to turn in, I decided to glance at the first pages of what turned out to be a trio of quarto-sized notebooks bound in plain black leather. The manuscript was handwritten in a neat, elegant script. I suppose that I intended to read for an hour at most, but dawn, seeping in around the edges of the curtains, found me still in my armchair, the finished manuscript fallen into my lap, and I into a fitful, uneasy sleep. Rain. Rain all day, all evening. The back end of the year. There had been no such rain in Africa, India, the Far East, those countries in which I had spent as much of my life as I could remember. And now I was here, alone in that London rain, in the autumn of my fortieth year. My story up to that date may be told briefly enough. I knew only that I had been sent abroad from England when I was five years old, after the death of my parents, about whom I knew nothing. My past memories were all of life as a young boy in Africa, with the man who was my guardian, an old friend of my mother's family. He never spoke to me at all about my birth, early upbringing, home or family. After some years we went to India, and thence to Ceylon, where it was proposed that I learn the tea trade. But secretly I began to plan for myself the life of a nomad, full of exploration and adventure. I had read in particular about the journeys and work of a man I came to regard as one of the greatest of all pioneering travellers. His name was Conrad Vane. 
When I was seventeen, my guardian was taken very suddenly ill, and as is the way with many a man who contracts one of the dreadful fevers, went from robust health to the point of death in barely twenty-four hours. For the next twenty years, I had travelled in India and all over Africa, and finally in the remotest areas of China. At first, my travelling had been more or less without purpose, but soon I had begun to fulfil my ambition of following in the footsteps of Conrad Vane. It was a satisfying life, but it came to an abrupt end when I contracted a debilitating illness in Penang. I was a middle-aged man and had undertaken virtually every journey Vane himself had made. I had occasionally met people from England. Now I conceived a longing to go back there. Above all, I wanted to discover more about the early life of Conrad Vane before he had embarked upon his travels and begun to write about them. And I had some idea of paying my eventual tribute to him in a book. I sold most of my possessions, packed up the rest, and booked my passage. And now here I was, alone, in the London rain. I obtained from the shipping company offices a couple of addresses of inns at which I might put up. After taking some wrong turnings and having to retrace my steps, I came upon Keypack Hyde Street and almost by accident, the door of the Cross Keys. As I stood getting my bearings, my eye was caught by some slight movement, and I glimpsed a figure. It seemed to be that of a boy, some twelve or thirteen years old. Thin, with a pale face above a dirty, collarless shirt. For a second, no more, I saw him look full at me, and then passed me quickly, as if anxious or afraid to meet my eye. When I looked back, the boy was gone. I turned and entered the inn. All was dark and silent, save for somewhere within the heavy ticking of a grandfather clock. And then, without warning, there came a sudden terrible cry, a screech or scream like the caterwaul of some creature in its death throes. It came once, ripping into the quiet building, and then twice more, a dreadful noise that set my heart racing. The room was quite empty, and I was about to reach for the small bell on the bar top when, glancing upwards, I saw a great oval brass cage, a parrot. With dull green, mouldy-looking feathers and a dreadful hook of a beak, sat there perched on one leg. Its eye glittered and it stared malevolently straight at me. I felt my blood run cold. Far, far at the back of my mind was some forgotten memory. I supposed from remotest childhood. What was it? Where had I seen such a bird? Heard such a cry? And why did it so terrify me? I was rescued by the entrance of a heavy-jowled fellow. The room he showed me into was small but clean. I washed and made my way down to the bar where I was served a plain, decent supper in a corner. I took a single glass of brandy and then returned to my room and went to sleep. When I awoke and turned up the lamp, my watch showed that it was not yet midnight. I was now so wide awake and full of a sudden restless energy, a desire for fresh air and movement, that I dressed and went back downstairs. The bar was empty, and the dreadful parrot cage covered over with a maroon shawl. But the landlord was still about clearing pots, and he agreed curtly to leave the front door unlatched. I was to bar it on my return. I retraced the route by which I had come earlier in the day, and before long came to the River Thames. The moon was three quarters full, riding high and giving enough pale light to see by. I should have felt uneasy or afraid, so strange was it all. But I did not. I had the odd sensation that I was following after someone, or that I was in quest of something, and very close to finding it around the next corner or the next. A hundred yards or so ahead of me stood a great black railway arch, and beyond that, higher, more open ground. I was lost. I stood wondering what best I might do when, catching some slight movement a yard or two behind me, I turned, and again glimpsed the figure of the boy. He had been following me then. I was quite sure. I took a firm step in his direction, half raised my hand to stay him. At that moment, a railway train came roaring across the bridge in a great clatter and belch of smoke and livid flame, sparks showering upwards from its funnel, and then it was gone.
and the smell of soot and steam drifted down to me upon the cold air. I turned back towards the boy, but he had slipped away, melting into the darkness, and I was left to try and make my way back alone. I spent the following week walking about London. Before embarking on my voyage to England, I had written two letters, the first to an antiquarian bookseller who had some interest in the voyages of Conrad Vane, and the second to the high master of the public school Vane had attended, some twenty miles up the river from London. I now arranged to meet the Reverend Archibald Votable, High Master of Alton, at the Athenaeum Club in Pall Mall, but first to visit Mr. Theodore Beamish's bookshop and offices in the district of Holborn. A doorbell had jangled rather rustily as I entered the shop below. My footsteps had echoed on the bare floorboards, but no one came out to greet me or inquire my business. I looked along the shelves at random until I came upon a book about that part of China in which I had travelled only a few years previously. As I began to turn the pages, I became aware of a strange, uncomfortable sensation, as if I were being watched. But there was no one. I was quite alone. I set the book carefully upon the shelf, and as I did so, turned my head. In the street outside stood the boy. He was dressed in the same ragged, collarless shirt as before, but he looked even frailer. His mouth pinched, his eyes huge and hollow and bright, as if he had a fever. But it was his expression which struck me with such force, and awoke an immediate response from deep within me, and chilled and frightened me too. It was one of such fear, and misery, and desperation, a pleading, anguished look that he directed at me, so that I could do no other than plunge out of the shop to try and reach him. Rescue him? I scarcely knew what. But as I flung open the door and hurtled down the steps, I was almost put on my back by a huge gangling youth coming up to the shop door and colliding with me. In his arms was a broad, shallow basket covered in a cloth, from which a hot, savoury smell arose. And as I reeled backwards and tried to recover myself, he said, "Mr. Monmouth, I take it, sir, and this one's yours and Mr. Beamish's dinner you had nearly spread across the street." Mr. Beamish attacked his food with complete and vigorous concentration, sucked down the dregs of his ale, and wiped his little pursed pink mouth. What set you on to Vane? He was looking at me closely. What do you know of him? What that he first journeyed across? No, no, not where. Him. Beamish had arrived at once at the nub of my reason for being here. Precious little, I said at last. I am hoping that you, among others, can tell me much more. Why? I blustered. He was making me feel uncommonly nervous and unsure of myself. I suppose. Well, it is simply a task that I have set myself. It attracts me, and I have nothing else to do. Then you should make it your business to find something. Leave be, Mr. James Monmouth. That's my advice to you. Leave be. You've travelled. You're safely returned. Your luck held. Don't tempt fate. Fate? How here in England, in the safety of this snug little island? Here, he said, here will be the most perilous of all. It is evil of which I speak, Monmouth. Wickedness. Things best left concealed, undisturbed. Whoever is touched by vain suffers.、Oh, Mr. Beamish, the man is dead. Ah, yes. Then of what do we speak? You may ask. You may ask. For a split second, then, looking into his face, hearing his voice in that gloomy room, I was gripped by a cold, dreadful fear. It entered like a splinter of ice going to my heart, and I now know that it never truly left me. However vague and odd the tales Beamish was concealing from me, there was some dark truth underlying them, some story of human depravity and misery. Perhaps I could have heeded his words then, and I am sure that it was not mere cussedness and strong will that influenced me. Yet the more he had spoken of Vane, the more fascinated I had become. The Mist in the Mirror by Susan Hill was read by Gareth Armstrong and John Moffat, abridged by Oliver Reynolds and produced by Jocelyn Boxall. I had been in London for almost three weeks and growing used to it. Once or twice in the East and in India, 
I had visited a gentleman's club, and sat in bamboo chairs under a fan, so that I assumed that I would feel at home as well in the Athenaeum Club Pall Mall as anywhere. But at the sight of the vast marble hall and rising staircase, and the glimpses through open doors to formal panelled rooms beyond, I all but turned tail and fled. But before I had time to do so, I heard a strong Scots voice behind me. Mr. James Monmouth, I'm sure. I spun round. The Reverend Archibald Votable was a man well over six feet tall, broad-shouldered, and dressed in clerical collar and black suit. When we were sitting over glasses of Madeira before a somewhat reluctant and smoky fire, I began to feel a little more assured and at ease with him. He was a man who invited confidence. What reason do you have for wanting to research into the life of uh, this man? I noted that he did not speak the name. Vain exerts a peculiar fascination upon me. Be wary. But of what? Of some dreadful danger? What risk am I taking? No, oh, no, no, no. He made to sound jovial, dismissive of my fears. There is nothing so definite. Then why make mention of it at all? Why warn me? Because you are honest, Mr. Monmouth. Honest and innocent. I left him on the steps of the building, an august commanding figure. He had given me an introduction to the school archivist, and told me there was a set of guest rooms which I would be welcome to make use of. On another matter, he recalled my saying that I was seeking rooms in proximity to the river. He had heard of some which might be suitable at Prickett's Green, Chelsea, part of estates belonging to the school. Number seven, Prickett's Green, was at the end of the small row, looking west. The caretaker opened the door to me, and at the foot of the old staircase turned up the gas, which gave some dim illumination to our ascent. I take it the house is empty, I said, pausing to get my breath. Always except in the basement. In which you live? He nodded, but did not otherwise reply and then unlocked a door and stood back to let me pass through. As I did so, I was unable to restrain my exclamation of surprise and pleasure. The room extended the whole length of the house, some thirty feet or so, and with three sets of tall windows, I stepped over to them. Below lay the river, almost completely dark now, but still just flushed over its surface by the last light from the sky. And as I looked, the lamps began to come on, one by one, along the embankment. And then I knew that when I looked downwards, I should see him, and knew precisely where he would be, huddled close under a lamp. I was not afraid on this occasion, though I began to be agitated. He stood pale, ragged, utterly still in a circle of lamplight, and as I stared directly at him, he raised his head, turned his face up to me, his eyes seeking mine out. And so we stayed, as if frozen in some other time and place, I, James Monmouth, in the dark upper room of the house, and the ghost of the boy in the cold street below. Two days later, I had moved out from the Cross Keys Inn and into the rooms at Number 7 Prickett's Green, I did not see the boy again, and indeed, with some curious extra sense I seemed to be developing, knew that I would not. All was open, cheerful, and unremarkable. I was too busy about my domestic matters to think much at all of Conrad Vane, but I planned to settle myself, and then to travel down to the school and spend some days there, making a start on my work. The fine weather changed on the morning of my departure. I arrived at Waterloo with scarcely a minute to spare, and was obliged to run along the platform and jump into the first available compartment. I found myself alone with a striking-looking woman, and I judged her, from my covert glances, to be in the prime of her middle years, wealthy and well-connected. Before long, I turned away to read my newspaper. When I glanced up again, I saw that it had begun to snow. We stopped at a station, and then another, but no one got into our compartment. I became conscious that the woman opposite was regarding me steadily, and in the end was made uncomfortable by it, and would have spoken, 
had we not just then stopped at a small station. I looked out. The snow was like feathers flying about the sky. Go back. I spun round. She had spoken in a low but quite firm, clear tone. I beg your pardon. Her eyes were very blue and slightly widened, as though she was seeing not me but something beyond. You should not go. I sense it very strongly. Quite suddenly, her expression changed. She came out of her trance-like state. I must apologize, but when it is so clear, I cannot help myself. It comes without warning. From the moment you entered the compartment, oh, my name is Viola Quinsbridge. My husband is Sir Lionel, the judge. It is sometimes very awkward that I know, am told these things, am given warnings. I become so horribly aware of, oh, an imminent death, danger, of evil surrounding someone. And have these feelings ever proved correct? Oh, yes, always, when I know the outcome, that is. Of course, I very often do not. I do not choose. Then I found myself beginning to speak about myself, my plans for the future, and the work on Conrad Vane. I am on my way to his old school where the library has papers, letters and so forth. I intend to stay there for a few days and begin my researches. Her face remained thoughtful. And then? What will you do at Christmas, Mr. Monmouth? Oh, I confess I've given it no thought whatsoever. She opened her handbag and took out a card. That is our address. We're only a few miles or so from the school. Come to us. We shall be quite a large party. You will fit in perfectly. I can't think of your being alone in a strange country at Christmas. I felt a warmth and pleasure within me as a result of her invitation. Her odd warnings and forebodings I preferred to set quietly aside. When the train pulled into the Riverside station at which I was to alight, she extended her hand. Now I shall expect to hear from you. The school porter who admitted me was a ruddy-faced man wearing a bowler hat and a greatcoat. He took my bag and led me into a great rectangular cobbled yard. We ascended a flight of steps and stopped in front of a door. The porter set down my bag. Here is your set, sir. Everything you should require. On pushing open the door, I found myself at once in a most comfortable sitting room. The lamps were lit, a fire burned brightly in the grate. The rest of the set consisted of a small bathroom and a bedroom, adequately furnished, and containing a long, carved and gilded mirror, fixed to the wall opposite the window. The sight of it made me start. It was so familiar. I stared, puzzled, tracing over every scroll and curlicue, certain that I had done so many times before, searching in the depths of my memory. But I was forced to give up. I had no clue as to where I'd previously seen it. I had always been a generally abstemious man, but that evening drank a glass more port than was sensible, half dozing before the heat of the fire, so that when I stood to go to bed I felt momentarily light-headed. But the bedroom was colder, and I opened the window wide. As I turned, a gleam of light struck the mirror on the opposite wall, and I looked up to face, as I thought, my own reflection. But there was none. There was nothing but a blurred, dark outline. Due, I suppose, to some trick of the atmosphere, the mirror was quite misted over. But, as I came up close to it, I saw quite clearly through the blur my own eyes, staring, glittering, wild with a dread and alarm that I was quite unaware of feeling. I lay shivering and wide awake, and feeling nothing so much as a terrible sense of frustration and anger. I saw a pale ragged boy, now here, now there, now following me, now a little ahead. The mirror had misted over. Were the incidents linked, or quite random? Were the phantoms and warnings and fearful moments brought about by anything outside myself? Or was I losing my sanity? I drifted to sleep, a restless and fretful one, wound about with veils of weird dreams. When I awoke, I was certain that a singing or crying had filled the room, or filled my head. But there was only a sweet and peaceful stillness and silence, 
and beyond the half-drawn curtains, the falling snow. The clock chimed two. My mouth was dry, my throat sore. I wanted water, and knew that I would not easily sleep again. I went into the sitting room. There was still a glow in the heart of the fire. For a while I sat close beside it, and gradually the last trails of nightmare dissolved away. Almost as if to prove to myself that I was man again, I decided to take a turn beyond my set of rooms to gain a better sense of my surroundings. I put on my coat and went quietly out. I saw the door at the end of the second corridor, the old library, and at once made my way towards it. It was as I was a few paces from the door that I began to have the sensation of being watched and silently followed. I shone my torch behind me. There was no one. Impatient with my imaginings, I turned back and went again to the library door. I expected it to be locked, but it swung open slowly to my touch. Oak bookcases were lined on either side of the central aisle, with more bookstacks rising behind the gallery, up to which iron spiral staircases led at intervals. It was as I approached the last few bays that I heard what at first I took to be the soft closing of the door at the far end of the room, but which went on, even and regular, like the breathing of someone asleep, a sighing that seemed to come out of the air above my head. I glanced up at the gallery. Someone was there, I was certain of it. The wood creaked. I was as far from my way of escape as I could have been, trapped alone in this empty place with whom, what? With nothing, I said aloud, nothing, and went to the spiral staircase and began to climb. The gallery was dark. The soft breathing came again in the darkness just ahead of me. I wanted to run but could not, and knew that this was what was intended, that I should be terrified by nothing, by my own fears, by soft breathing, by the very atmosphere which threatened me. As I returned to the corridor, closing the door of the library behind me, I caught sight of a light moving about irregularly on the opposite side, and as I rounded the corner I glimpsed a dark-coated figure walking slowly and holding up a lantern. The porter, I supposed, on his rounds, and felt a wave of relief so great that it all but felled me and took my breath, and I was forced to lean against the wall. He had gone off through the bay's door before I reached the bend in the corridor. I saw no more of his flickering light. All was quiet. And then I heard something else. It came from behind another door, an oak one set well back into the wall, with a green curtain pulled half across and partially concealing it. What I heard was a boy weeping. It was a sound so desolate and of such loneliness and despair that I felt outrage and anger and the urge to rescue him. But the door was bolted and barred. I could not break my way in to reach him. But there was surely someone who would. The lodge was in darkness. I knocked urgently on the door, but then turned away and looked about me, trying to plan which way I should go. I had not paused to ask who the boy might be. I had only the urge to reach and comfort him, rescue him from I knew not what. I heard a bolt being drawn in the door behind me, and turning, saw that the light had come on in the lodge. I stared. The porter stood before me, tousled and half awake. It was clear to me that he'd been asleep when I knocked. I'm sorry to disturb you when you've only just returned to bed. It's four o'clock in the morning. What did you think, sir? Think? Well, that I should have only just gone to bed. Four o'clock, sir. I've been sound asleep these six hours past. As he spoke, and I registered what he said, I turned and looked at the single line of footprints across the snow, and realized that they were my own, and that there were no others. No one else had come this way for hours. Certainly not the porter, going steadily on his night rounds, carrying a lamp. The Mist in the Mirror by Susan Hill was read by Gareth Armstrong and John Moffat. It was abridged by Oliver Reynolds and produced by Jocelyn Boxall. Dr. Valentine Dancer, the school archivist, was a man who matched his name. Moving about the room, darting to the window, he had suggested we go out for a tour of the school. He ended outside a row of houses behind Scholar's house. He flung open the front gate with a grand gesture. 
We married men live here. A door stood open, and in the doorway a little huddle of solemn children. Behind them was a tall young woman carrying an infant. Hetty, my wife, he then extended his arm to the young ones, and Evelyn, Isaac, Jaffet, and Hector. I was ushered into his study. A young maid brought tea. The children were banished. Books lined the walls. His desk was piled high with papers. I have everything a man could wish for, and the best of all, Monmouth, is that I know it. I know it. Happy that man. You will stay to lunch, of course, though I fear it will be a bear garden. It's very good of you to be so hospitable, but I'm very anxious to be shown the vain papers so that I may begin work at once. Do you know what it is about him that so fascinates you? There is a power, an attraction exerted by evil. Oh, come. Yes, evil. Conrad Vane was an evil man, Monmouth, and he used the power of wickedness, a dreadful power, over others. He was cruelty personified. I am grateful to you, I said at last. I have received hints and veiled warnings. No one has begun to speak the truth until now. So I have deterred you, he said. Now you will stay to enjoy lunch. No, Dr. Dancer, you have not deterred me. My fascination is keener still. He shuddered suddenly, and got up and began to pace about the room, rubbing his hands together in agitation. Whoever touches, explores, follows after Vane, will be run mad, and will never afterwards rest his head or enjoy his peace or have a home. He will be haunted. He will be cursed. A door opened. I heard the infant laughing, a soft, innocent laugh. I looked at Dancer. But, I said at last, and realized the stark truth even as I spoke it, unlike you, I have nothing to lose. Dancer took me back towards the cloisters. The library was ahead. I wanted to ask directly about the crying boy and dared not. As we came up to it, I could not restrain myself from looking at the recessed oak door behind which I had heard his desperate sobbing. It was not there. I stopped dead. Dancer was looking back at me with concern. He had taken out a bunch of keys and was sorting through them. Every other door was as I had recalled and seen it before. Only the dark door behind the half-drawn curtain was not. My dear man, are you unwell? You're deathly pale. I did not want to tell him anything. Oh, it's nothing. I'm subject to these moments of giddiness, a mild, inherited weakness. I heard myself babbling on. He turned back to the library door, continuing to search through his keys. Uh, perhaps, I said cautiously, the door will be unlocked. Oh, no, no, the library's never left open. Ah, he selected a key. Now he would find it open. <laughs> there. It's always a little stiff when no one's been in for a day or two. I heard a click, and the key turned. Dancer led me back down the room to the shelves I had begun to examine the night before. If indeed I had, if the door had indeed been open, if I had not been dreaming. But they were as I had seen them, the leather-bound school journals and records, row after dull row. I had been here. Dancer went about other bays and twice up to the stacks in the gallery, returning with piles in his arms, travel journals, letters, a history of the school. Anything by Vane, or which mentions him, it is all here. If there is anything else, you are to come to us. You must not hesitate. I do not want to think of you here too much alone. I thanked him, and he left me, his brisk steps going off down the corridor. It was after two o'clock by the time I came to the first hint of anything, a record of a senior school debate. It was upon the subject of voodoo and witchcraft, and a prominent and vociferous speaker had been C. P. R. Vane. And then I came upon first the report in the school record, and then the account taken from a newspaper of the death of a boy at Alton. His body had been found hanging from a beam in a locked room. He had been beaten, and it was stated that when last seen, and for some days previously, he had appeared to be in a state of distress. He was thirteen years old, and his family resided at Kittiscar Hall, in the remote village of the same name, 
in North Yorkshire. His name was George Edward Palantyre Monmouth. In the middle of the night, I remembered the leather trunk which contained everything I had kept from the things in my guardian's bungalow in Africa. Now the trunk stood undisturbed, together with the rest of my belongings that had been delivered to Prickett's Green. I did not know why it should now have come quite so vividly into my mind, but I lay and thought about the trunk, looked at it as it were in my imagination, unstrapped it and lifted the lid. I knew that I had to sort through everything anew, for I was even more desperate to find some trace of my former existence. George Edward Palantyre Monmouth. Was it the purest and most bizarre coincidence that he bore my own surname? Was it his poor ghost that I'd heard sobbing behind the door? Was he the pale boy? Had he been trying to attract my attention, haunting me in a desperate effort to seek my help? And what did he want? In beginning to find out about Vane, I had apparently stumbled upon clues to my own history, and I cared about this most passionately of all. I returned to London the following day. I had thrown my bag unopened upon the bed, dragged the old leather trunk out from its standing place in the passage, and fumbled with the stiff clasps and locks that had been untouched for more than twenty years. I found no letter, no documents relating to me, no birth certificate, which surely my guardian must once have had. If there had been any papers, they had been destroyed. Light-headed with disappointment and fatigue, I began to feel like a wraith myself. It was as though I had no substance, no real existence in this world at all. And then I came upon the prayer book. It was a small copy bound in soft black with wafer-thin pages. I riffled through it, shaking it. Nothing fell, but as I closed it, my eye caught the line of writing inside the front cover still strong and clear, because it had not been exposed to the light. James Monmouth, his to remember, old Nan, Kitty's car. I stared at the careful old-fashioned handwriting, and as I stared, something deep within me stirred in response. Old Nan. Old Nan. I flung myself into the chair and remained there as the fire sank and slumped down upon itself, scouring every recess of my memory. Old Nan. There it was. Yes, I had it. There. No. A hint, then. A slight scent. Faintly in my nostrils. Then it was gone again. Old Nan. But I was satisfied in one respect. George Edward Palantyre Monmouth of Kittiscar Hall, Kittiscar. I had proved his connection with me. The following morning, I received a letter from Lady Quinsbridge reminding me of my engagement to spend Christmas with them. She would have me met from the train at Hisley. I thought it likely that the house would be a grand one and the party smart, and that I should therefore need to get myself a few more clothes. A thaw set in just before Christmas Eve. The sky was overcast, the air foul, but I went for a walk among the stalls of Covent Garden Market. When I returned that night to pack my belongings, I thought that I might have caught a chill, but I took some powders with hot rum, slept well, and in the morning decided that I had succeeded in shaking it off. I dressed with some care and called a cab to take me to Waterloo. At the last minute, I slipped the small black prayer book into my pocket. I realized that Conrad Vane, and what I had discovered about him, had ceased to dominate my thinking. It was the boy, George Edward Palantyre Monmouth, to whom I was now in thrall. At Hisley I was met by a car. I sat forward to look ahead for my first sight of Pyre. It was indeed a magnificent and extraordinary place that rose before me, a soft grey stone house with a wing on either side. I saw a classical orangery and a slope descending out of sight towards the lake. Then we were stopped, and Lady Quinsbridge was coming quickly down the steps to greet me, and I was swept up into the splendour of her world. The house was magnificent, with a great hall, dark wood panelling and old polished furniture gleaming in the blaze of the log fires that burned in every room. I was dazzled by it all. But at once Lady Quinsbridge was at my side. You're looking tired, Mr. Monmouth. There is something wrong. I can see it, sense it. Well, you are safe here. We will look after you. 
I made my first acquaintance with the rest of the house party, and Sir Lionel Quinsbridge himself. His manner was welcoming and friendly without reserve, yet I detected a shrewdness in his eyes that told me that he acted as a balance and temper to any impetuosity on the part of his wife. The house and estate, he told me almost at once, had come to them through his wife's family. Lady Quinsbridge was a woman of substantial means. It was as enjoyable and impressive an evening as I had ever spent in my life, the food excellent, the atmosphere convivial and festive. So thoroughly was I swept up into the company that I was able to ignore any reminders that I was unwell. From time to time during dinner I had felt my skin burn. At others I longed to creep close to the fire, and alone in my room gave way to a shivering fit and dosed myself with whisky before getting gratefully into my bed. At last, though still feeling ill, I fell into a peaceful sleep, and awoke, weak but in some measure restored, to the sound of the bells of Christmas morning. Just after ten I went down. In the hall, Weston the butler met me, and told me that the party had gone to church. There is a good fire in the morning room, sir, and you will find old Mr. Quinsbridge there. I went across the hall to the morning room, and beside the fire settled so deep in a wing chair that at first I did not see he was there at all, was the gentleman I took to be old Mr. Quinsbridge. Take a seat, my dear sir, take a seat. His eyes were huge and alert, gleaming from out of the parchment-coloured skull. His long legs stuck out from beneath the rug, and together with his stick-like arms and etulated neck, they gave him the appearance of a grasshopper folded up into the chair. I went to shake the hand he extended to me. It was like shaking a bunch of long, thin bones. Take a seat, sir. It is Christmas Day. This is my son's house, Lionel. He's my only son, though I had others. I saw that his eyes were closed. He seemed to have gone instantly to sleep. I waited, wondering what to do. He awoke again as abruptly as he had slept. Monmouth, Monmouth, I knew a Monmouth where... Did I? I wonder, Monmouth. If you were to remember anything, I should like to hear it. He shuffled a little, rummaged his legs about. It is Christmas Day. I am particularly anxious to discover anything about my family, I said. I am certain there must be those who remember, who can give me some clue as to my parentage. All dead, he said. I am ninety-four. His eyes were closing again. He muttered my name in a vague, puzzled way once or twice, and then slept. I sat on opposite to him, my head aching, turning over what he had said. Sir Lionel had been at Alton. If old Mr. Quinsbridge had been at the school, surely he would have been almost a contemporary of Vane and therefore also of George Edward Palantyre Monmouth of Kittisgar. I wanted to shake him roughly to wake him, question him, force him to remember. But I could no more have broken into his sleep than into that of a baby. In the peace and quietness of that calm room, I too closed my eyes and slept a little, like another old tired man, and woke with some embarrassment as Lady Quinsbridge came in to find us, followed by the rest of the party. And so... We began to celebrate Christmas, I doing my best to conceal my increasing fever and sickness. I succeeded until evening, when I collapsed again, this time more seriously. A doctor was sent for, and for many days I was wretchedly ill, tossing with a fever and blinding headache, slipping down into the dark, swirling waters of delirium time and time again, unsure even who or where I was. I had been sleeping on and off for days. My sense of time had become blurred, but I remembered coming down the stairs for the first time since I'd been taken ill on Christmas Day. Even that small effort had exhausted me, but the doctor who'd been attending me insisted I was ready to make the first move out of the sick room. At his invitation, I took to spending the evenings in Sir Lionel's study, a shabby, comfortable room, book-lined with deep armchairs, and the old black Labrador Fenny stretched out on the hearthrug. Here, as we drank a glass of whisky, our talk ranged over my travels and those countries I'd come to know so well. 
It was Sir Lionel who suggested that I should begin making a formal plan of work. Stay here with us for another week or two. Your strength has been greatly depleted. Why not get into some routine of work? Divide up your life and your travels. Take each part separately. Retrace your steps and remember everything you can. You must not let it all go to waste. And so I began on the following morning. I took down the World Atlas at first and sat looking through it, setting down places and dates, going over routes and listing them. And as I did so, I remembered faces, buildings, even talk. My past was not lost to me, and in retrieving it, I began to recover my youth and some of the sense of my own identity, which I had lost since arriving in England. Once or twice, as I went over the journeys I'd undertaken, and remembered why I had ventured to this or that remote and obscure place, the name of Conrad Vane came to my mind. But I turned away from it, for now I was myself, James Monmouth. These had been my journeys, and the story I intended to tell was mine alone. I had been at work for a week when several friends and neighbours came to dine, and in the course of the general conversation a colleague of Sir Lionel's happened to mention a journey he had taken north the previous autumn. It was far from my usual beat, but I must admit that we had a superb day's shooting in glorious country. I defy anyone to paint me a grander prospect than the countryside spread out below Rook's Crag, looking over to Kitty's Gar. My fork clattered onto my plate. Kitty's Gar? Lady Quinsbridge put her hand on my arm. Kitty's Gar, I beg you to tell me about it, to describe it. Tell me anything. I almost got to my feet then. I must know. We were seated around the table after the ladies had retired. The man who had spoken was the lean, sharp-featured lawyer, Crawford Maythorn. It is rugged, fell country, with rounded hills and gentle slopes, shelving down to small villages. I tell you, to sit up there and watch the shadows chasing one another over the open hills, to see the sunlight catching on clusters of slate roofs far below, and hear nothing but the wind keening and the bleating of the sheep. He shook his head. I listened, seated tense and straight in my chair. He had described a countryside I knew. As he spoke, I felt sure that it was familiar, and I had been there, seen these things. He had not told me about Kittisgar itself, but now he turned to me. I do not usually venture as far off the beaten track. Just once, though, I did go. I'm afraid there's precious little I can tell you. Kittisgar's very small, a hamlet, no more, with the usual grey stone cottages, a chapel. There is a hall, I believe. Yes. I remember seeing some sign or gatepost, but nothing of the place itself. The talk then turned to matters of sport. After another ten minutes or so, I made my excuses and went to bed. The description of the countryside by Kitty's car had awakened memories, but I turned away from them deliberately. They would swirl and drift about. I would half glimpse them, only to lose them again, as I had lost my own reflection through the mist in the mirror at Alton. Two days later... I received a note. My dear Monmouth, by chance I've had to make contact with my shooting companion on the trip to the north last year, and I mentioned to him your possible connection with the area. He tells me that Kittiscar Hall is lived in by a woman. She's elderly and alone, apart from the usual house staff. Her name is Miss Monmouth. I felt certain, in view of her name, that this information would be of some interest to you. Sincerely, Crawford Maythorn. Now I thought... It is pursuing me. It is I who have tried to turn my back and am fleeing. I crushed the letter up in my hand and threw it in the fire. When I went to my desk the following morning, I intended to add several more pages to my African journal, but when I set pen to paper, it was as though I were taken over by a force quite outside myself. I began a letter. Dear Miss Monmouth, my name, as you will see below, is your name. I have in my possession a prayer book given to me as a child and inscribed as from Kittisgar Hall. Whether we are related, I do not know, but it seems most likely. What you know of me, if anything at all, I would very much wish to hear and have information about any other members of the family, living and dead. Sincerely, James Monmouth. A couple of days after I had written the letter, I took the dog, Fenny, and set off from the house in the early afternoon. We came down the slope, and the lake lay before us, its gunmetal surface still and smooth, reflecting the winter sun. 
All around me, the banks were white with clumps of snowdrops, heads bent upon their delicate stems. I rested my back against one of the beaches to drink in the sight of them, and try to imprint it upon my memory. Then I saw him. He had come a little way out from between the trees on the far side of the lake, and was standing there, apparently looking down at the water. The boy. His head was bare, he wore the same torn white shirt and grey trousers. His face was as pale as ever, deathly pale. My heart was bursting within my chest. This was no ghost. This was a real, living boy. If I went to him now, I would be able to touch him, speak to him. There was nothing shadowy or insubstantial about him. So he had followed me here, to Pyre. And then he looked up, deliberately, and we were face to face across the lake. His expression, distant, anxious, pleading, distressed me beyond bearing. Who are you? I called out then. Why have you come to me again? He stood motionless and silent, and his look sent a chill of fear and desperation through me. I began to move. Wait! I shouted. Wait there! But he turned away slowly, sadly. He was further away than I'd thought. The path dipped down as it turned. I followed it, half running. When I came up the rise again, the boy had gone. But he remained in my mind. His pale face and ragged form, his air of desperate pleading, came before my eyes. I sat brooding about him, addressing him in my thoughts. Who are you? Where do you come from? What are you asking of me? But I knew who he was. I had known since Alton. After a quiet dinner, I asked for the fire to be made up in the library and settled down at my desk. I became deeply immersed in a particular account of a journey I'd made into the tribal heartland of Kenya. I wrote until my wrist ached and I was forced to set down my pen. The fire was smoking unpleasantly. But the chill I felt around me had to do with more than that. I felt a presence in the room. I was being watched with hating, hostile eyes. I sat terrified. Something was here. Evil and hatred, decay and cruelty were here and directed at me, and I could not escape. I could neither move nor speak. It was as though I had been gripped by complete paralysis of the will and body, taken by an unseen, unknown presence and force. But it was not silent. I realized that now. For now I heard the soft, regular, sighing breathing, and was unable even to lift my hands to block out the sound bound tight by invisible cords and quite helpless. I did not faint or cry out. I did nothing except close my eyes and wait, completely possessed by fear and by the presence in the room. In the end, it simply left. I was loosened from my bonds. At last, I looked at my watch. I had set down my pen at a couple of minutes before ten. Hours had passed. Then the clock gathered itself and struck. Ten times. I could not remain here, or indeed anywhere now, or rest, until I had followed my instincts and attended to these things, whatever they were. For some reason that was quite unclear, I knew I must go to Kitty's car. Indeed was being urged to go. I had an inner conviction that I had once belonged there, and perhaps still did so. Two days later, I returned to Prickett's Green. I hoped to find a letter from Miss Monmouth of Kitty's car, but there was none. I went out for my supper before going back to make some arrangements for a train that was to take me on the long journey north. Raw Mucklaby was a dull little village, enclosed by the moors that rose behind it, and which, when I arrived that morning, were in shadow. But the inn was comfortable, and the landlord friendly. I took my leave of him cheerfully, and began my walk to Kitty's car. This was a world in which I felt at home. These were places I knew in my bones. I saw a wooden signpost, Kitty's car half a mile, and went on slowly up the last slope towards the houses. Several times I stopped to stare at closed doors, at gates, at fences, willing the door to the past to swing open. I walked on up the steep slope of the village lane and came out beyond the last cottages and a farm. To my right was a path leading to an open gateway, on the gate, just discernible, though faded and half-worn away, was the name Kittiscar Hall. My heart seemed to be squeezed tight within my chest, 
as I looked at the old letters. And then the house was before me. A plain old country manor. It was large and dark, and it was neglected. It seemed empty. The shutters closed in several of the upper windows, and the whole place silent. I had expected it to be familiar to me, to give a cry of recognition, but I did not. I might never have seen it before. I wandered along the side path that led into a derelict and empty garden. In the centre, on the overgrown grass, was a leaden statue. It was of a graceful boy, raised on one foot, with an arm outstretched. The forefinger which pointed up was broken off. And then another flash of clear memory came to me. I knew the statue, every curve and line of it. I had stood in that garden. I had woven stories to myself around the figure of that solitary, leaden boy. I turned and looked back at the house, and then I saw that a thin plume of smoke rose from the chimney. Miss Monmouth must be at home. I made my way to the front door, pulled on the bell, and heard it echo within. I rang again, and eventually heard footsteps and the sound of bolts being drawn back. I stood my ground, but with rising apprehension, and the door of Kittiscar Hall was opened. I said, I have come to see Miss Monmouth. She nodded and moved back to indicate, in silence, that I should step into the hall. I stared in wonder at the heavy tapestries covering the stone walls, and the dark pictures that loomed above me, at the oak doors and uneven flagged floor, the huge hearth with a coat of arms carved over it. And as I stood there, the gate swung wide at last, and the past came flooding towards me like a river, so that I almost drowned in it. I was a small boy again, standing here, gazing about me in awe and apprehension, and clutching onto old Nan's hand. If you'd like to come this way and wait a few minutes, I will take you up directly. The woman was way-faced and soft-voiced, without the local accent. She'd seemed unsurprised by my appearance. It was likely that Miss Munworth had spoken of my letter. The woman returned after some while, and gestured towards the dark staircase. We reached the landing and turned, our steps sounding hollow on the bare oak boards, until we stopped outside a door. So, now I was at last to see Miss Monmouth, my only living relative. My mouth was dry, my heart beating hard in my chest. It was a bedroom, long and low-ceilinged. I hesitated, unable to see into the gloom, but the woman stepped across to the windows and folded the shutter back. Then she left the room, and I was alone with my relative. A carved oak bed stood opposite to me, without curtains or pillows, and I went forward quietly, preparing my first gentle greeting. She wore a bone-coloured cotton gown, and her grey hair was pulled back from her forehead, and dressed in a thin little plait which rested in the crook of her neck. Her arms were folded, hands together on top of one another. Her eyes were closed, her skin was dull and waxen. Miss Monmouth was dead, and I, the visitor, had been allowed to view her corpse and pay it my first and last respects. In panic I looked up from the dreadful still figure laid out before me, and my eyes found the wall behind the bed. On it was an elaborately carved mirror, with faded and cracked gilding, and dark streaked glass, the exact counterpart of the mirror that had been hanging in the bedroom at Alton, and as I stared into it my own face, pale and with terrified haunted eyes, looked back at me, dimly, through a grey, swirling mist. Gareth Armstrong and John Moffat were reading The Mist in the Mirror by Susan Hill. It was abridged by Oliver Reynolds and produced by Jocelyn Boxall. Miss Monmouth's funeral was a plain affair in a neat, well-kept little church. I exchanged some friendly words with the officiating clergyman, an old retired canon who had, he said, visited my relative occasionally in the past few years. And now, I said, I hope you will visit me. He frowned as if he had not understood. I am Miss Monmouth's heir, the only member of the family left, or so I suppose. I shall return to London to clear my belongings and some few business matters there, but then I shall return and take over Kittiscar Hall. The man was looking distraught, his mouth working as if he were desperately trying to nerve himself to speak. Think hard, Mr. Monmouth. Think it over most carefully, I urge you. It is a lonely life here. Surely London will stimulate you more. 
London holds no interest at all for me. I have come home, and here I shall stay. I proffered my hand. My own grip was firm. His hand was trembling and uncertain in mine. He walked with me to the roadside and watched me leave. At the corner I glanced back. The wind was blowing bitterly cold off the moors and rippling through the branches of the yews in the graveyard. Underneath them, and looking away from me towards the freshly mounded earth of my relative's grave, stood the boy, ragged, pale, thin, and quite as clear, real, visible to me as he had always been. I averted my head before he could turn to look at me, and quickened my step away from the place. Shortly after three that afternoon, I decided to go up again to Kitty's car to look over the hall and begin to familiarise myself with it. I had wondered if the house might be empty, but the woman let me in almost as soon as my hand touched the bell, though she stared at me blankly and for a few seconds did not step back to let me in. I said, I'm sorry it's a little late, but I have come again simply to go around the hall. As you wish. Of course it is yours to take away what you choose. Oh, I do not imagine I shall take anything away. I shall leave all the furnishings as they are, and I have little of my own to bring. She continued to stare at me, but now a look of almost horror crossed her features. You surely are not planning to live here at Kitty's car? Why, certainly I am. I am the heir to the house, am I not? But you cannot. Surely you will not. Why do you say so? Because... Because you are a Monmouth, and a man. I felt a clutching sensation in the pit of my stomach. Whatever was wrong, whatever I'd been warned about in the past and again now, had to do with Kittiscar Hall and the Monmouth family in reference to its male line. For a moment I wanted to have it out with her there and then, to hear the full truth. But I did not ask. I dismissed it. I went into every room at Kittiscar Hall that day, everywhere from attics to damp, unlit cellar, and down every passage, and I felt nothing in the slightest degree fearful or dreadful there. I saw no ghosts, heard no strange sounds. At last I returned to the attic, wondering if I might make these my own quarters. It was as I gazed through the grimy casement that I saw the grey stone walls of the building I'd glimpsed on my first visit and now I saw that the roof went to a point at the top of which was an old bell, and realised that I was looking onto the chapel belonging to the hall. The house was quite silent as I ran through it, and out at the side door to the overgrown grassy paths and shrubs at the back of the hall. Then I came out into a small clearing, and the chapel was immediately in front of me, dark, still and silent, grim in the last of the light. I hesitated before the wooden door, feeling suddenly cold, and as though a shadow had fallen over me, and someone unseen but hostile was standing just a few feet away on my left side. But I steeled myself, summoning up every ounce of resolution I possessed. At last, taking a deep breath and muttering an impulsive prayer for protection, I put my hand to the iron ring that served as a handle. It turned easily. I hesitated before pushing open the wooden door. It was the smell that struck me first, a sour, penetrating smell of cold, damp stone and earth. The floor was cracked and sinking, and here and there bare earth showed through. The walls were stained with damp and mould, the pews unsteady, and in front of the altar the remains of a cloth that almost rotted away. Then I saw that the stones at my feet were engraved. Here lies Joshua Monmouth, born 1583, died 1613. Here lieth Digby Monmouth and his sons. Here lies, here lies, here lies. I traced out every name. My ancestors were at my feet. How many of them I could not tell. Then I came to a last stone, close to the steps, and bending down, for it was growing darker now, traced with my finger the outline of the words. Here lies George Edward Palantyre Monmouth. I stood every tomb of every Monmouth of Kittiscar, every male, for there was no woman buried here. And then my eye was caught by a plaque let into the wall, altogether more elaborate and flourishing in style. 
I went closer and read it. This memorial erected to Conrad Vane of Kittiskar, Imperator. As I stood, trembling before it, horrified, confused, and yet somehow at last in dawning understanding, I heard a sound, and turning, saw the door of the chapel which I had left open begin slowly, softly to close. I ran to it, reached out and grabbed the handle, but rattle it, twist and turn and wrench it as I might. It would not yield to me. The door was not only closed, but locked, and I locked in by it, trapped in the darkening empty chapel. I waited, trying to calm myself and to order my thoughts. Outside the door I had sensed a watcher, a presence at my shoulder. Now I felt it again, a looming, malevolent presence that had lured me here where I was intended finally to be. A Monmouth among others, long dead and buried and decayed. He was standing at the open entrance to the crypt. I saw him, shadowy, hunched close to the wall, his body half concealed by the dark, heavy clothes he wore, his face slightly averted. But I knew him, knew him for my tormentor and betrayer, as well as for the murderer of my young, innocent relative. And then I cried out, What do you want? What do you want of me? My voice rang round the stone walls and echoed mockingly back to me. And then I fell silent and bent forward, sobbing, my head in my hands, in fear and despair. When I'd gained control of myself again and raised my head, the place was pitch black and deathly silent. I peered forwards and saw nothing. Sat still, straining my ears, and heard nothing. He had gone. Then, from far away, from somewhere outside in the night, I heard the boy sobbing, sobbing in all his young loneliness and anguish and despair, the same that I now felt. I had been lured to Kittisgar and to my inheritance, the last surviving male member of my family, and was no more intended to go free than my pale, tormented boy. That night was the most terrible I'd ever spent, or pray to God I will ever spend. Waves of evil and malevolence crept towards me and receded again like waves of some sinister, silent sea. Again and again I returned to hammer and rattle and bang upon the door and wrench in rage and impotence at the handle, but it was immovable, as if it had been locked and rusted for centuries. How I clung to life I do not know. By dawn I was indeed half dead, half mad. If the cannon had not ridden to seek me out, then I would have been very shortly beyond salvation. He found me on that fresh, cold, dew-filled morning, crouched on the floor of the chapel, my arms crossed over my head like a terrified animal. After he had turned the handle of the chapel door, and finding it unlocked and easily opened at a touch, come cautiously in. It was many weeks before my mind began to heal, and even now as I write this some forty years later, I know the frailty of my sanity and health. I learned a very little more about Kittiscard, my family, and the curse that had been laid upon it centuries before by an ancestor of Conrad Vane, as evil as he, and upon whom he seems to have modelled himself. Kittiscar, the hall, the village, and the land around had been wrenched from my family. The Vanes had triumphed, and they had pursued and corrupted and hounded every male Monmouth, including my own father, as finally Conrad Vane had sought and lured and ensnared me, even from beyond the grave. All these things I learned or pieced together over many months, the canon being reluctant to tell what little he knew for fear of unhinging my mind again. He was a sterling friend to me. What strength and peace of mind I regained, and now possess, I owe to him and his unselfish, prayerful devotion. I was alive. The hauntings ceased altogether, and have never returned. I only worried from time to time about the boy, whose distress and grief I felt I had not assuaged, for all that he was now entirely absent and silent. But very gradually even he began to fade from the forefront of my mind, and at last I ceased to think of him. Eventually 
I took up the study of law, and that has been my satisfactory profession these past years. I never married, and so I am the last of the Monmouths. The family dies when I die. The curse and the evil and the hauntings are certain to be at an end then, and the world a better place in the absence of us all. I am quite alone now. I have lived the last forty years in fear, and never told it. Only now at the last I move to write this, and so lift the burden from my back and lay it down. But I was surely not meant to live so long, nor ever in such comparative safety and contentment as have been granted to me, and for which I heartily thank God. Sir James Monmouth's story remained vividly in my mind for the whole of the day after I had sat up reading it. I vowed that when I returned it to him I would sit and keep him company a little. I was never to do so. When I went to the club at the end of a tiring day, I was greeted almost at once by the news which had been the talk of the place since the previous evening. Sir James Monmouth was dead. He had been found sitting in a chair in the corner of the library in the hour just before dawn, an expression of what was said to have been amazement upon his face. There was another story, too. There had been some sort of disturbance, perhaps an intruder in the club. The night porter had surprised a boy, a ragged urchin of twelve or so, and chased him, taking him to be a young thief or vandal. But on reaching the street outside, and even after running some way down it in both directions, he had been forced to return to the club. There had been no trace at all of any boy. At the time of Monmouth's death, and after reading the story he had given me, I confess that I was profoundly affected by it and by the events of the club. But my own life was not touched any more closely, and so, inevitably, as the months and then years passed, the whole matter receded from my mind altogether. Until very recently. My business has prospered. I have become very well established. Lately we have been looking at larger properties in the home counties, and it was with some interest that I received particulars from one of the house agents of Pyre, Berkshire. Indeed, I managed to find Sir James's manuscript, and in it to re-read the description of the house I knew we must certainly visit. The exterior of Pyre was exactly as he had described it. The interior, though, was quite ruined, ghastly in its vulgar, over-ornate furnishings and decorations. But we went on dutifully up the staircase. It was as we reached the end of a passage in the west wing that I saw the mirror. It was large, in a handsome gilded frame of considerably finer and more classic design than any of the other furnishings, so much so that I paused in some surprise to admire it more closely. And as I looked into the slightly foxed and pitted glass, the surface seemed to blur and dissolve, as if it were misting over with a fine white vapour. I stared in dawning recollection and fear, for the face that I saw staring back at me through the mist was not my own, but that of another. <laughs> 